shop. Uh, I gave tours from second graders to evidently the chief engineer of NASA. It didn't matter if you were a second grader or the chief engineer of the NASA. You got the same tour. Um, <laughs> it's part education, part entertainment. And the machinists, the programmers that work in my six areas of manufacturing at JPL, they're on the third half of their career. Mathematically doesn't work out, but <laughs> they have worked wherever they were, and they realized that they were a little different. They always stood out as being the best at what they were doing, who also had that same calling. I'd like to work for NASA. Um, working for me was difficult. Working for NASA was more difficult. Um, I would typically hire somewhere between 20 and 40 interns, and out of that I picked maybe one or two. So it was really the best of the best. JPL stands out a little bit different from the other nine centers. Clearly they all have a center at the end, and JPL has a laboratory at the end. What we do is we design, we build, we test, we fly. Sometimes we don't always test, like is in Curiosity, we didn't get a chance to test the Sky crane, we just went by seat of the pants. <laughs> Times it works out. Um, but NASA was transforming from a management phase where for the last two and a half decades, they managed the space shuttle program. They designed it in the 70s, they outsourced it, it got made, but for the most part, there was very little R&TD, research, in technology development. It was managing the space station, managing the, the shuttle fleet. Um, and some strange reason, I gave one of my second grade tours to the chief engineer of, at NASA, and this class was being developed by Ohio State University, and it lacked the NASA side of the class, or the argument. And you can teach someone how to drive by a book, but they are probably going to be a very bad driver. So you can get book smart. But to become a good designer, to become a good engineer, you have to design, you have to engineer. So with this, we probably see very few WPI engineers at my classes because it's about the design for manufacturability. Um, it's been around for a long time. When JPL, when WPI started in 1865, you didn't need a DFM class. You spent time in the shop. You made things. You got your engineering degree by being a road scholar, ROAD. You spent time on the road. You built things. Um, I like to talk a little bit about tolerance. Now, if you're ever in LA and you're traveling along Route 10 and you're heading to Santa Monica, don't make the mistake I did. There's a museum of tolerance. It's the wrong one. <laughs> I went in looking for machines. But the, the professor that I teach this class with from Ohio State University likes to call Eli Whitney a fraud. I removed that from the slide. Um, he tried to do something that needed to be done, interchangeability. The question is, when do we need to change things out? If you're making a ground spoiler for a 737 airplane that is 10,000 plus, you probably want to be able to take that ground spoiler off, put another one on, not have to worry about shimming or fitting it. That's real important. When you're building a revolver, interchangeability and tolerancing is real important. He sold Congress on the idea of quickly building um, rifles. He custom hand fit them like a watchmaker. He went to Congress, he took them out of a bucket and put them together and said, look, this is what you want. Got the contract, but he hand fit those. The problem was that technology had not reached the area of development to be able to produce parts with a tolerance level of interchangeability. We've come a long way, baby. So they asked me to spread the word around NASA and try to make, and I coined this phrase, I stole it, to make a rocket scientist a better rocket scientist. Because the majority of brilliant people that work for NASA are not good with their hands. And with the upcoming budget of the baby boomers needing more Medicare and more Medicaid, 
the amount of budget for NASA is going to dwindle. And the message is, you know how to make things, and you know how to make things with less money. So, tolerances are not easy to achieve. And I question everything. So you come to my shop with a five-place decimal, I'm going to ask why. Did you do a development stack-up? Did you do a tolerance stack-up? What's your main part? What I don't want to hear was, it's what my calculator gave me. <laughs> so, this room is full of people who know how to make things. It might be a little bit boring, but maybe I can entertain you of what I actually have to sit through and try to get machinists, I mean, excuse me, scientists to understand. Uh, I pissed off a whole bunch of scientists at JPL. When MER was getting ready to launch, they waited and realized that everything was overweight. They didn't realize that as a machinist, all you try to do is get inside of the tolerance zone, I'm done. I've met the intent of the drawing. I'm complete. What they didn't realize is that when they tried to weigh it, why is it heavy? How could it possibly be heavy? Because machinists don't put things nominal. Designers design nominal. Machiners, machinists deliver things differently. Yes, that's a scrap part. So that's an outrigger panel. Let me show you where it goes. So here's the sky crane. It's one of eight of these plates. It basically centers around a hex plate that holds all the piping, the pyro valves, all the computers for the outrigger. Um, reaction control thrust, thrusters right there. So if you ever watch the movie on YouTube, you'll see uh, these little jets of stream that come out of the aero shell. That's the reaction control, control thrusters. Um, so what they decided was something new. We're not only going to give you a set of drawings, we're also going to give you a weight. I don't care if you've met the design intent. This part starts off at 450 pounds and ends up just under 8 kilos. So what we say is about 90% of the chips land on the floor. And we had a power outage. And sometimes when you have power outages, the S word happens and it went right through the part. Finish cut. But it makes a nice trophy for open house. <laughs> That's okay. So use realistic tolerances. I don't want to see the calculator. <coughs> The other thing you don't want to see, and what scares me, is when you go into a machine shop and you see everybody with a calculator. Because every time that machinist has to calculate or convert from metric to English, it's an opportunity for error. NASA loves to push metric. 1969, President Johnson says, we're going to convert over to the metric system. You're no longer going to buy a, a quart of milk, you're going to buy a liter of milk. Well, I'm 55. It's 2013 and I still buy a quarter of milk. <laughs> However, NASA wants to push metric drawings. We did lose a spacecraft, which we don't want to talk about, <laughs> because somebody put X number of pounds of fuel instead of kilograms, but it's another story for another time. Um, so, it should be manufacturable, no calculators required, and tolerances that you use should be understood. Most people don't understand what the micron is, but most people want to design to the fourth and the fifth decimal place. That's a human here. Um, until you've actually tried to achieve a tenth position tolerance on a whole, you really don't know what it is. It's not only difficult, it's damn difficult to do. <coughs> so, bracket from hell. I didn't know if I had children in this class, so. <laughs> We have a saying at JPL, cog is king. It's a bad statement. So this piece comes into our shop. And it looked like a piece of sheet metal. Sheet metal parts should have sheet metal tolerances. Then we started looking at this. The perpendicularity between this surface and the bottom surface is roughly the thickness of a piece of paper. 70 series piece of aluminum, we machined it, we heat treated it, we stress relieved it, we machined it, we stress relieved it, machined it, 
I made a half a dozen of these. We only needed one. Never made it to print. Now, you like to think that this thing is very, very critical. Well, here it is. It's not much more than the RS-232 ports on the side of your computer, or on the back of your computer. <laughs> this doesn't mean shit. <laughs> Flex ribbon cables, up, down, right, left, a mile. Why would you design? So how to, at JPL, the customer pays for the first part. We pay for the rest. We bring the, we bring the designer in, he goes, God, I was hoping you wouldn't talk to me about this. Now, the designer is a contractor who wants very badly to be a JPL. So the last thing he's going to do is make a fuss. He looked at this and he goes, oh my god, this thing is bad. So we call in the cognizant engineer and he looked at this part and he goes, what's your problem? Instantly we knew we had the chip on the shoulder. I, we can't make this part. It's not possible to make those tolerances. And furthermore, we researched it and it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. Let's roll this out of a couple of pieces of sheet metal and be done with it. No. Now, one of my many hats that I wore at JPL was I was also a COG teacher, instructor. So I had this gentleman as one of my students years prior to that. I helped educate this gentleman to become a COG. And you finally get to the point where you get a piece of hardware. This was it. This was his piece of hardware. One, not an instrument, not the remote sensing mask, no. This bracket. And he says, it needs to be accurate so that it's done right. No many parts to speak of. It's right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it cost our taxpayer dollars, I'm sorry, about the price of a Six series BMW. <laughs> now, you could say, well, you didn't charge the customer. No, but I paid for it. And guess who paid my salary and my employee's salary? Went to his manager. Manager says, Cog is king. I will not tell my manager to change his mind. But just look at the common sense side of it. No. Made the part for the door. This is a sad case. We lost the case. We ended up making it as close as we could get. It was eventually a use as is, and we moved on. Here's another one. Realistic surface finish call outs. Most people don't understand what a 32 finish, 16 finish, etc. You can get a really fine finish on a lathe. It's good at making fine finishes. But don't take a round part, put it on a milling machine, and expect to get really smooth finishes. It's a different process. This is the fart sniffer. This is the Harriet cell that measures methanol, but it also determines by the ions whether it's biological or geological. To me, this is one of the most critical instruments in MSL. We fell in love with this part. What's unique about this part? This part came into my shop at Rev C, and it left at double K. <laughs> However, the untold story was, he says, listen, Richard, we're not done designing the part. You can rough it within 12 millimeters. Stress reliever. We'll be back in a few days. Okay, you can now start to finish the upper surface and move your way down. So the revision changes were really one of the finest examples that we saw at JPL of concurrent engineering. We're going to get into that in a second. Now, where the Harriet cell goes, now this, this actual instrument was struck from the rover. Because of funding, they said, we're going to leave this off. We all went, well, wait a minute. We all know we're going to build another robot, Pathfinder, MER, which is Spirit and Opportunity, Curiosity. We know there's going to be another one because eventually we're going to have a sample return. We may eventually put people on Mars, but it's going to be long after we bring samples back. Well, what are you going to bring back for a sample? Do you really want to bring back a boring rock? Because a boring rock on Mars is a boring rock on Earth. Wouldn't it be really nice, first of all, to determine whether or not we had geological or uh, a biological methanol? I mean, methane? Yeah, sure it would be. And then try to find out where that source is coming from so the next rover goes and gets the golden sample, the sample that we really want to bring back to Earth. 
Because at that point, yeah, a human being can see something in 10 minutes that takes a rover a month to do, but let's bring back the right item. So JPL, out of their own budget, funded this. And this is, it goes in SAM, and SAM is an instrument suite, and it is, well, here's the TLS, so it's a tunable laser spectrometer, and it's a little eight-inch project, two highly hollow spherical mirrors. The laser enters, we know what the laser looks like before it hits the atmosphere, bounces back and forth 80 times, and then exit, as well as it has three laser beams inside of this chamber that are all bouncing back and forth, never touching each other. So they look at pre and post laser beam and determine the, the gas, the ion, etc. Extremely complex. So SAM is inside of the body of MSL, and that's just about what every square inch looks like. It's unbelievably packed. Very, very, very beautiful item. Um, the other thing that we, we are amazed is that sometimes they try to help us. It's a half-inch corner radius. We did that because we know that you like half-inch end mills. No. <laughs> Sorry. I understand what you, but if you had just spent five minutes, when we're rolling into a corner, we don't want to use any more than 45 degrees of that end mill, because when you end up in a surface where you're using greater than that, it chatters, it creates a very bad finish, and typically breaks, and then ruins the part that we're working on. Uh, what we teach is, know your manufacturing environment, bring them cookies and donuts, <laughs> get to know what they're capable of, and just spend five minutes in the shop learning what they can and cannot do. Don't assume. You know how to spell it. Standard sizes. We would like you to go out, Bridget, and buy 11 16 head stock. No. No. Back to the word. The world is a metric world is NASA. Go out and buy an 11 millimeter piece of plate. No. No. You can buy 7 16 if you're really lucky. But you're going to get 3 8 or half inch, and then we'll spend all that time machining it down to the 11 millimeters when you really didn't need 11 millimeters. Standard sizes. Really, really important. We also tell our scientists don't ever purchase material for us. Don't do that. Allow us to determine the size that we need. Because super glue is only so good. You have to hold the part. Um, and quite often, we're going to need a little bit of extra material. Oh, but the material is expensive. You guys are laughing. You've said, seen this, right? Oh, this happens time and time again. No, absolutely amazing. Um, I use this slide for something slightly different. This is to talk about stress relieving and heat treating the, uh, 300 series stainless steel, it really, that's a submariner, clearly changes the corrosion resistance of it. Um, it's, it's, don't do it, but more importantly, the message here is that if you have to weld something, don't weld finished machine components and expect them to be aligned within four decimal places. Weld it, finish machine. I can't, every week of my life at JPL, I got, Yes, what? This piece is no good. What's wrong with it? It's out of tolerance. Oh yeah, well, I remember machining all those components together. Who welded it? We had a shop on the outside welded. They said they couldn't hold, you know, one thousand. Well, of course you could. <laughs> weld it, finish machine it. Oh, I didn't know about that. Because this is typically how it's done. It's done in. We think we're a little bit smarter, but not everybody comes out of WPI. <laughs> <laughs> into the picture as early as possible and if you don't know who's going to machine it hire a consultant there are tons of manufacturing engineers out there as well as machinists who do who want to do nothing better than help make better engineers and designers bring them in early in the process and it changes the whole outlook I'm amazed at the number of people, including machinists, who think machining is slicing cheese. <laughs> now, it may look like it, the chip comes right off, and that's just what happens. This is what happens. There is a tremendous amount of energy going on in here. You're shearing that plane, it takes thousands of degrees of going, what's going on right there, and that temperature is going several places. The question that I always ask somebody who's designed something on the outside, had it made on the outside, was, 
what's your structural material like now? How well did they cool that part when they were machining it? Did it affect the overall structure of the material? I don't know. Um, if you don't worry about heat, you have to worry about heat because you can clearly change the alloy <coughs> and tensile strength of your material. The top deck of Curiosity was made three times. First time it was made, now we go, let's go back a little bit. Your blueprint is your contract with your manufacturer. If your manufacturer makes it like the blueprint, you pay it or her. We gave them a 70 series piece of heat treated aluminum and we're making basically a one-sided waffle. Tons of people do it. Every aircraft is made out of waffle plate, but we sell it to the lowest bidder who had never machined a waffle plate in their life. And unfortunately, we provided the material. We provided two inch plate for roughly a one and seven eighths thick top deck of the rover. So they take a skim cut, they turn it over, and they rough out all the waffles, they let go of the clamp, and the thing turns into a Pringle. <laughs> a very expensive Pringle. So they go over to marketing, who looks at the, the drawing and goes, doesn't say we can't straighten it. <laughs> There's no no, go straighten it. <laughs> yes, the top plate is in two pieces. Where would you like it? <laughs> Pardon me? We tried to straighten it, it cracked. Well, of course it cracked. It's, it was tempered, high tempered aluminum alloy. You didn't say we couldn't. By the way, that was the case for the lawyers, and yes, we paid for that. So they came to me and they said, Richard, hey, we need you to make one of these right away. To make a spacecraft, you design it, you send it through mechanical analysis, you send it through thermal analysis, you talk to the planetary protection people, and then it comes to the machine shop. So we look at this thing, it's roughly five and a half feet by four feet, and we put it up in the, in the, on the wall, or all of us, you know, dozens of people were all looking at this thing because they needed it yesterday, and that's hard to do it. Job. We look it over, we go, we can't make it. We don't have a machine, large enough envelope to meet that tolerance. Five ten thousands over 60 inches. Half a thousands aluminum. Aluminum likes to move one ten thousands per degree temperature rise in the building. If you're familiar with California, it gets cold at night, 60s, and hot, 105 during the daytime, and you try to maintain a level of consistent temperature, but temperature moves, material moves. So we said no, and then why not? We can't hit five tenths. How the hell did that get there? Oh, we forgot to move the decimal point. <laughs> so we made the first one, or well, somebody made the first one, at a level of tolerance of, of a four digit decimal place when it only needed to be a three digit decimal place. I didn't know was the answer. So we then made two more. Same machine chomp and an additional machine chomp. Um, so, this is what happens. This is what goes on. This, they're not all horror stories. This is a good story and a bad story. <laughs> so, so the dirt tube is actually in the turret or sauce spot. Sample acquisition, sample processing and handling. That's the end of the robot arm. It uh, either drills or picks up a scoop of dirt Hopefully one of these days we'll pick up a cockroach and we'll go, ah, you know, life. <laughs> that hasn't happened. But we pick it up and we slide down a dirt tube. Now, this original design was extremely difficult, very, very expensive. Tight tolerances all through these bores, tight, tight finishes, 16 finishes, very, very, very tight. So our engineer, mechanical engineer, manufacturing engineer, got a hold of the designer and says, what's your design intent? Well, he says, it's really, we don't want the dirt to stick, so we want a fine finish. What about tallow? Oh, we, we don't care that. We don't care about that. But when it bolts together to the mating surface, we don't want a party line. We don't want rock seven to accidentally look like rock one. We don't want a little bit of dirt to be stuck here and then all of a sudden break loose, get into the, the, the slide. Because the amount of dirt that MSL collects is tiny. Take a toothpick, cut off about quarter of an inch of a piece, and that's about what we take into the slide. It's minute. So it wouldn't take a lot to collect on these surfaces. 
Great. Fantastic. So if you want tight tolerances, we're going to put a tolerance zone so only the end of the piece is on it. We'll just polish it. I have a guy who races motorcycles and loves porting and polishing. We'll let him polish the hell out of this thing. It'll be beautiful. Worked fantastic. Almost. What was missing? Well, first of all, you learn early on that if you bring a component to inspection that's full of burrs, full of oil, full of dirt, guaranteed that part will be rejected. Inspectors can inspect for acceptance or expect inspect for rejection. You cut your inspector, he's rejecting your part. I don't care how good it is. It's rejected. So one of the things we learn is you make it look pretty, you wash it, you polish it, you clean it, you take all the burrs off. So the machinist put a nice little chamfer, small, on either area. But when they went in there with a the boroscope and looked at that, what did they see? Parting line. So there's an area right in here between the mating surfaces where the dirt would collect. So what was missing from the drawing ultimately scrapped that part. Three series BMW, by the way. <laughs> I got a lot of things accomplished at JPL. This is one of them that I'm proud of. This was a standard spherical nut used for aligning optics. We do a lot of optics at JPL. Um, I realized over the period of time that just about everything we build looks just like the thing in the past. It's all an optical bench and a computer that analyzes it. Optical benches will either be a single, double, or triple beam optical bench. You've got a bunch of mirrors on it, a bunch of lenses on it, and a crap load of these spherical nuts all used for aligning the, uh, all the optics. This was a typical, yes, thousand dollar nut. Why is it a thousand dollar? That surface up there, we had the mill of hex and then Keller with a 30 second end mill, that radius on that top surface to make it look like the drum. Now what does a spherical nut do? It needs this surface to align to an axis of a thread. That's all it needs to do. So when they're screwing it down, the optics plate is moving around. Nobody questioned this, they just make thousand dollar nuts all day long. <laughs> this is now what JPL builds. This is a spherical nut, this is a thirty-five dollar nut, make these by the thousands. Saved you guys a lot of money. A couple BMWs. We see this all the time. What do you mean you can't do this? So, I mean it's pretty art deco. I think it's color. So what we have here is a large chassis that needs to have a critical counterbore. What's going in here? A washer and a nut. Clearance. <laughs> but the scientists want the bore here to be within this hole within two thousandths of an inch, slightly less than the thickness of a piece of paper. And they want it to align to this clearance surface. So that drill literally has to be a foot long. <laughs> Can't be anything less because it has to actually rub up against that surface. Slanted surface. What do you think that little tiny drill is doing when it hits that slanted surface? It's walking away. We spent weeks trying to figure this out. We ended up putting in a bridge port upside down with a hand drill, an old fashioned back spot face, which worked well forever, and just back spot facing this. And then not making the print. Got to use as is. Again, so you go, can you redesign it? No. Why not? Well, because I got to go through thermal, three week delay. I have to go through mechanical analysis, four week delay. I don't have time. The alignment of the planets, the Mars is not going to wait for it. I need you to make it. So this is part of BUD, BUD bridal umbilical device. So this is actually the sky crane. This is the guts of the sky crane. What you can see a little bit of the uh, Plastic fiber, that's the, that's the rope. It's not cable, it's rope. Plastic, high, high, fiber, high plastic fibers. The orange cable, if you've ever owned a European car and you found an orange cable in your car, fiber optics. It spoke to, had dual computers on, Emmett, on, the, out, on the, uh, the descent vehicle as well as a rover. So we had dual computers, that was our redundancy. Um, and it was basically just a big coil, that was the winch cable that you'd see on an overhead winch. And that's where it mounted all little holes. Didn't mean anything. A lot of money. The other thing that scientists don't understand or designers is that why can't I put two dollar pins, you make a part with two holes and have it fit every time. I stress the point that there's not a machine in the world that can do that. 
not a single machine in the world. Spend any time in the space station? Sleep in the new crew quarters? Yeah. Oh no, this is the new phone. This is the new phone booth. Because prior to the phone booth, you basically stuck yourself up against the wall. Now you have privacy. You got a nice little phone booth, air conditioning, you have a laptop. It's a great it's a little bedroom, but literally it's the size. Most of you guys don't even know what a phone booth is. You're all <laughs> <laughs> But this was a master jig that assembled it. So the first time they went to go use this, they took all four of these uh, plates and they didn't fit, they had to hammer them on. Because all you need is a few millionths of an inch apart, and whole size for size, they just don't fit. Bang them on. Well, how do you think you're going to get? No jacking screws. They put this thing together. They bonded it. Never got the part off. They milled it off. <laughs> Oops. This is how you do precision constraints. You do a hole in a slot or a diamond. This works well. No, I need accuracy. No, this is accurate. The part's not going to move. You only have six degrees of freedom and you don't need much. Really? No, really. It's nice to see these eyes open up in a design club. Cool, I didn't know that. Now, we have a term at NASA it's called GD&T hacking. Geometric dimensioning and toggling is a great thing and it really sucks. You can take a simple device, design it, that normally would take an inspector five or six minutes using standard tools to either accept or reject the part and be done with it. GD, GD and T happy prints take a CMM three or four weeks to program, three or four weeks to, to inspect for something that didn't need it. Recent graduates of GD and T classes are usually GD and T happy. But this is a case where it really works out. Plus or minus five on a whole location gives you a square tolerance zone. Well, if this was acceptable, why would that be acceptable? Because that's the same distance from center. We were throwing away 57% prior to GDT. We just didn't know any better. Uh, it's a great system that works. It's also a great system that can bite you in the tuchus. Know when to use it and know when not to use it. Clearly, if you hold the part this way, you get one dimension. You hold it this way, you get another dimension. We always stress datums should not be implied. Tell us how to hold the part, how to inspect the part, how to make the part. Bonus tolerances, maximum material conditions. You will make every machinist in the world extremely happy by putting that little circle with the amp. It is wonderful. It's not giving them, you're not cheating. It just allows you to use the math to accept a greater range of parts that still work every form, fit, or function. Here's a nice little example of it, where if you were making, I like to think of this as a tube. If you were making a tube at 10.2, the feature of size would allow that part, now this is not the scale, you would allow that part to have a slight, not, per, not a perfect shape, and still allow it to fit. You can greatly increase your, your bonus tolerance and accept parts. It's not a difficult class, if you have a designer that haven't been, has not been through gd &T, send them through, but don't allow any drawings for the first two weeks. They have to get over that gd &T happy bit. This is the slide of flights. This is the slide that everybody who takes my class takes, comes away from. We are asked to estimate parts, and this is how we estimate parts, and I have been in industry, general dynamics, I've been in aerospace, and this is the basic example that marketing throws over to us. We look at it, plus or minus five, 125 finished, that's the basis, that's our estimate. Now what we start looking for is, did you add tighter tolerance? The estimate just gets doubled, tripled, quadrupled, all the way, we're just increasing it. I thought everybody wanted to work for NASA. I mean, I clearly didn't. I didn't understand this. We would have to send parts out to machine shops, and we would give them drawings, and they go, no, thank you. What do you mean? This is going to be our curiosity. You can put this on your wall. We'll give you a poster. No, no, thank you. What do you mean, no, thank you? Listen, Richard, you guys come around once a decade with drawings that are near impossible to make. You're going to tell me to stop machining it halfway through. You're going to ask me to leave it on my machine for a few weeks while you roll a revision, no thank you. I said, well, 